Next here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Venice, Italy, the site of the Venice Biennale, the oldest and most prestigious international biennial art exhibition. The theme this year is all the world's futures. And in an introduction to the Biennale, the curator, Okwi and Wazer, writes, quote, how can artists, thinkers, writers, composers, choreographers, singers, and musicians, through images, objects, words, movement, actions, lyrics, sound, bring together publics and acts of looking, listening, responding, engaging, speaking in order to make sense of the current upheaval, he asks. We'll speak with Okwi and Wazer, the curator of the Venice Biennale, tomorrow. This year's Biennale has not been without controversy. Many countries have pavilions with art exhibits inside. In May, the city of Venice shut down Iceland's pavilion um, in the Biennale after the artist Christoph Buchel, working in collaboration with the Muslim communities of Venice and Iceland, turned a 10th century church that had been closed down for 40 years into a working mosque. Police claimed the art project was a threat to public safety. Last week, the Gulf Labor Coalition staged an hour-long occupation of the second floor of the Israeli pavilion. The group has also protested the use of migrant laborers to build Guggenheim's new museum in Abu Dhabi. On Sunday, the Gulf Labor Coalition held a panel uh, discussion called Who Needs Museums and Biennales? I spoke to one of the speakers after the event. My name is Marco Baravalle. I'm a member of Saladox Collective of Venice. Can you tell us what Saladox is? Sure. Saladox is an independent space for arts and cultural production. Uh, it, we occupied the space in 2007. It was a, an abandoned uh, salt warehouse, an ancient building in the heart of Venice. And when I say we, I mean a group of uh, artists, art workers, and activists, and also are students of the different uh, University of Art in, uh, in Venice. And in 2007, the reason why we decided to occupy this ancient space, which is owned by the city, by the way, so the property is the property of the city, was because at the time we were listening, uh, uh, witnessing a new development of the city, meaning that from being the traditional uh, museum city that everyone knows, uh, Venice with gondolas and art history, we were seeing the fact that a new economy of contemporary arts and contemporary culture were growing. And this was an extremely interesting development, but at the same time, he had many contradictions and many, many kind of um, dark sides, let's say. Dark sides that are the fact that these investments were investments that were made, for example, by financial tycoons, by billionaires that really uh, use art as a kind of tool that, that can uh, boost their status, or the fact that many of these very rich art institutions and foundations were and are using precarious labor and unpaid workers. And of course, as people that, uh, who are living in Venice and working in Venice, we needed a space that could become a critical point of view on all this development, which is, again, economic, social, and political, and that at the same time was a laboratory, so that we not only protesting, but that we also organize and produce culture, exhibitions, seminars, actions, publications, and so on. Can you tell us the history of Venice I, in a nutshell? But for people who perhaps know it as the city of canals, but tell us about Venice. Venice, Venice, it is uh, a unique city, and still is. Uh, I mean. Uh, I think what is really, really extre extremely unique in Venice, besides the fact that it's beautiful, and that's of course uh, banal, but it's real, it's the fact that the city was built in an in a, in a, uh, incredible balance between the human people intervening in the environment and uh, respect for the environment. And this is something that went throughout all the history of Venice, which is a history that has more than 1,000s here now. And uh, for example, example, if we refer to the present time, this history of, of, a, of a, a unique 
balance between human intervention and nature now is put in danger, for example, by, uh, by the big cruise ships that you have may seen here passing inside the canal. These monsters of the sea, these huge ships that are really passing in front of the San Marco Square are posing a serious threat to the environment, to the lagoon, which is a very, very kind of delicate and unique environment. And I'm mentioning this campaign because this tells you uh, uh, some more about what we do in a solid ox. We're not only focused on uh, art and art things, but we are uh, an activist space in network with other activist realities, with other uh, social uh, organizations and movements in Venice. So, for example, we are also very much um, committed to the struggle against big cruise ships, which is nowadays crucial in Venice. And I would say it's one of the things that more is posing a threat to the history of this city. And are you concerned about climate change here? We are pretty much concerned about climate change. Of course, the, 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 uh, Venice uh, is impacted by climate change, not only Venice, but its mainland. Uh, for example, you come from the U.S. Not, not later than a few weeks ago, the, there was happening uh, near Venice, close to Venice, uh, a tornado. A tornado which we usually see in the U.S. and we don't see it so often here in Italy or in Venice. And this was, uh, of course, only a symptom, but a clear symptom of... Uh, uh, of climate change effects, of climate change happening. It was extremely destructive and extremely, uh, I think, uh, uh, tragic for Venice. But of course, the other issue is that of the uh, raising of the average of the sea level. We are in a lagoon. We are very close to the sea. The sea enters the lagoon. So in a way, if all the uh, prediction about the, the, the raising of the sea levels are real, we must be worried. We must be worried because we, uh, we could be one of the first cities to go underwater more than we already experience high tides and so on. And it is a city of canals because basically Venice is now the, the result of a, of a few of different islands that were linked that were linked through bridges. That's why of course we had gondolas and, and, and boats and, and so on because uh, in the first years of Venice, Venice was not, as you see it now, was not uh, different islands linked but were, there were islands without links, without bridges. So it, it is really an archipelago, let's say. That's how Venice kind of was, was founded, and it developed. And with austerity sweeping the continent, of course, in Greece and Spain, how does that affect Italy? And how does that affect the Biennale, the Venice Biennale, which is so well known for this massive exhibition of art that is also has a lot of support from the state? In the United States, conservatives might be listening to you and saying, I agree with this critique. The Biennale shouldn't be supported. The arts shouldn't be supported. Mm -hmm. This, this happened in Italy even before austerity. So our politician didn't need uh, austerity or crisis uh, to not support arts. This is unfortunately a typical feature of Italian politics, especially during the 20 years of Berlusconi government. Uh, it was famous, the statement of one of his minister of culture who said, you don't eat with culture. And the consequence is, if you don't eat with culture, we, don't, we are not funding it. So unfortunately, um, apart from such big and important international events and traditional events like the Biennale, the, the uh, public funds for art are um, almost not existing in Italy. Concerning the austerity, of course, we are in a, we are a Mediterranean country. Uh, that means that uh, we are deeply affected by crisis, and we are uh, on the edge, really, of, of austerity of austerity policies, which were uh, hitting Italy very hard, not as hard as Greece, but we probably be the next in line. Meaning that, of course, we. Uh, uh, the, the Troika and the so-called European institutions asked to the governments of Italy brutal reforms, reforms that really are going to the direction of cutting, of uh, further cutting to welfare, to culture, to environment, and so on. And unfortunately, we must say that both right-wing and leftist politicians in Italy really obeyed, were really completely obedient to this uh, uh, command of, of, of austerity of the, of the Troika. Speaking of austerity, 
austerity. Another huge problem is, is housing policies, for example. Uh, the, 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 the private market of, of houses and of rents in Venice is completely crazy. It's out of control. So, for example, you don't see, if you come here, just walk from Rialto to Piazza San Marco, you don't see it. But there are networks of uh, people who occupy uh, apartments uh, that are very, very large. I mean, uh, there is a, a an organization which is called ASC, Assemblea Sociale Casa, Social Assembly for Housing. And this is a network of more than 50 occupied apartments in Venice. And it puts together uh, migrants, young people, students, but also Venetian families, families that before austerities could, uh, I mean, could pay the rents and after austerities and with the crisis, they cannot effort to pay to pay these rents anymore. Can you tell us the history of the Venice Biennale, what it means? It is a very complex history. The Venice Biennale was the first biennial of the world, was founded in 1895, and since then it really uh, it, it developed out of the model of the world uh, exhibition, the exhibition of 19th centuries, in which all the different nations were bringing uh, their last technological discoveries, uh, discoverings, and and so on. And it took this model from the world expo and basically uh, adapted to the art. So that's why the Biennial was organized with national pavilion and still is organized with national uh, with national pavilions. And the biennial has a very complex story of political and economic ties with, with the city too. Uh, of course, there is all the official history of the Biennale, but there is a very strong counter history and counter narrative of the Biennale. Uh, we spoke today about the protests of 1968, protests that of course were uh, were uh, happening in Venice. And and touched the Biennale too. And, and why were the protests happening in Venice? Because it was 1968, and so there was a, basically a, a world revolution going on. Of course, it was a, a, a big time for social movements all over the world, and Venice was no exception to this stream of protests. And the protests uh, touched the Biennale too. The Biennale was accused of basically um, repeating a, a colonialistic vision of the world by having this national pavilion hosted, of being a nationalistic uh, um, event. Uh, very, very much uh, tied to the official polit politics of the countries that were hosted here. And the interesting thing is that uh, after this protest, the Biennale basically started a, a very radical institutional reform because it needed to be a, a more democratic, a more democratic institution. At the time, the statute of the Biennale was the statute that was written directly by the fascists, by Mussolini. So it was still that kind of institutional structure that the Biennale had. And nowadays, a collective like Sale Docs or present time activists uh, working in Venice are, continue, are keeping to. Uh, uh, approach the Biennale from a critical point of view. Of course, problems are pretty much different from uh, those that you could find in 1968, but you still have many different problems when coming to such an art event. I'm just mentioning two of them, which we touched in the in today's discussion with Gulf, in the Gulf Labour panel. First of all, the problem of labour. So, the Biennale is a very rich institution. Lots of money are invested both by uh, private and public institutions here. And uh, the Biennale generates a, 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 large, uh, a large amount of labor, but this labor is precarious or is largely unpaid. There is a problem, for example, with the uh, university internships. We don't know how many university interns work for free, not for the Biennale directly, but for all the linked e exhibitions that happen that happen in the city. Second problem uh, is the problem of the re relationship between the exhibition and the city. So we are speaking of the very famous creative city. And uh, how does the Biennale work as the Venetian version of the creative city policies? Basically, these 100 or so events that you have in town pay very high rents to be here in town. And to who does this money go? To uh, They go to the pockets of the landlords of the city. They go to the pockets of the uh, biggest real estate uh, owners and actors in the city. So that's why we see a paradox. And Saladox is trying to intervene 
within these contradictions, for example, by creating an alternative model uh, of a pavilion in which the, it is basically the city and the people working for the city, the art scene of the city, which takes advantage of an, of an event like the Biennale and in which the labor is fairly paid. So this is only one example of what we do in here. I dare say uh, Venice-based artist with the group Solidox speaking here at the Venice Biennale. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, we'll be joined by the president and curator of Creative Time, which is holding a summit at the Biennale here today through Wednesday. We'll be back in a minute.